for 13 years and has designed many a multi-million selling front page in his time. See how big you can get there. As big as you like. Today, with the help of graphic designer Eddie Kashegua, he's composing a ripper front page to investigate the links between modern tabloid style and pioneers of new journalism, like the star. There's no doubt that the headline remains a massively compelling part of the commercial sell of a newspaper. A headline works at a number of levels. If it can make your reader smile or slightly recoil, um, uh, then you have achieved a good trick there. Papers which practice new journalism, like The Star, had already begun to understand the importance of eye-catching headlines. The Star really gets into the great sort of headlines. The murder maniac sacrifices more women to his thirst for blood. Now, turn over to the Times of its day, which was a very stodgy offering, look. Yeah. With one headline saying, another Whitechapel murder. So, there's no doubt which one you're going to pick up. Yeah. Kelvin is drawing from original Star articles to create his own headline. I heard a cry of murder in a faint voice. This is a neighbour who had overheard yeah. the killing of one of the uh, Ripper victims. I think we should go for that, don't you? Put a big quotes around it. I heard a cry of murder. The neighbour tells it all only in the star. The star had already begun to use illustrations to bring its stories to life, but hadn't yet understood the power of a front page image. But Calvin's not making that mistake. Today he's using authentic Victorian etchings to create his front page. Not that. Where's, where's the one? Yeah, there's this the fella. One. Yep. This one here, because he's thought to be with one of the victims there. This is supposed to be the very second that the Ripper knifed a victim. He's got the dagger in his hands, he's got his hand round the throat. Um, yeah. That's pretty compulsive stuff. And by the way, makes them rather more interesting front page than uh, T.P. O'Connor managed. T.P. O'Connor trumped by Casey McKenzie. Read all about it. That's the front page. Print it. All the national newspapers covered the Whitechapel murder story, but the star was to take things one step further. The star needed a suspect that would keep the Whitechapel murders in the news. They went looking for a popular angle, and once again, they weren't too bothered about the truth. The star made a shocking move. They decided that the killer must be Jewish, and the reason they did this is because there was a feeling against the Jewish community in the East London area, and this is what they said. He is a Jew or of Jewish parentage, his face being of a marked Hebrew type. There was actually no evidence. There was a rumour and they injected anti-Semitism into it. It was a disgraceful moment in journalism. Just like their serial killer angle, the star's Jewish theory turned out to be a circulation winner and other newspapers swiftly copied it. This was the popular press pandering him to anti-Semitism, to xenophobia, to hatred of foreigners in a way that we can see parallels now today. In fact, one newspaper said no Englishman could have committed such a crime. It had to be a foreigner. It's this thing of turn on the ethnic minority when you can't think of anything else to do. Sir Charles Warren, the commissioner of the Met, said at one point that uh, the Ripper was probably Jewish, probably a socialist and maybe both. <laughs> This was an ideal way to sell newspapers for them. So they went through the suspects. It had to be a Jew. And if it wasn't a Jew, perhaps it was an Irish man, the next best thing. Or other ideas said a Malay, high on opium. Another one was a Portuguese soldier, because it was thought that Portuguese were prone to mutilation. The majority of nationalities in London at the time were blamed for the murder, because it couldn't possibly be a, a nice Englishman. 
The star called their Jewish suspect Leather Apron, borrowing a nickname local prostitutes used to describe a particularly rough hunter. The story helped it to reach the massive daily circulation figure of 300,000, less than a year after its launch. But it also nearly got them into a costly libel suit when Leather Apron turned out to be the nickname of a real and entirely innocent person. So this guy, Leather Apron, actually existed. His name was John Pizer. He gets furious, round to the star offices, grabs over the crime reporter and says, you give me 50 quid, otherwise I'm going to sue you. Out comes the 50 quid. Now, this is 120 years ago. This was quite a lot of money. At that, Mr Pizer disappears, and so does the story. For several weeks in September 1888, the killer lay low. The news desks were quiet, reporters were idle, and editors were anxious as they saw their sales plummet. Then on September the 27th, a letter addressed to the boss arrived at the Central News Agency, an organisation which syndicated news stories across the world. It claimed to come from the killer, and for the first time, reveal the name that would become legendary. Kelvin is consulting historian Andrew Cook to find out more about this sensational document. Here we have a copy of the so-called Dear Boss letter. And this is the letter which, for the first time, actually says Jack the Ripper. In fact, it says, quite politely, yours truly, Jack Absolutely. the Ripper. Absolutely. Well, in fact, they start off here Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police had caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I am down on whores, and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. My knife's so sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. God, that's a gruesome payoff. It is an amazing thing for a murderer to sign themselves. A tremendous sort of taunting. They've merged together Jack, which is a classic name, Spring Hill Jack character, who was a Victorian bogeyman character at the time, and Ripper, which obviously, you know, encapsulates an aspect, a key aspect of the murders themselves. So combining the two, you've got a very powerful, evocative name. The reality is that were it not for this amazing name, Jack the Ripper, these murders would have been lost in history. But before his new name is made public, Jack the Ripper will strike again. And this time, he'll claim two victims in one night. At 1 a.m. on the 30th of September, 1888, Elizabeth Stride was found murdered in Whitechapel. The third victim of a killer we have come to know as Jack the Ripper. 45 minutes later, and less than a mile away, a second victim, Catherine Eddowes, was discovered by the police. This killing spree would come to be known as the double event. Kelvin McKenzie is visiting the scenes of both murders with veteran crime reporter Martin Brunt. This is the very street where Elizabeth Stride was murdered in a revolting manner. What do we know about her and how she was killed? She was originally from Sweden, uh, a woman in her 40s. Uh, she was the Ripper's third victim. Unusually, her body wasn't mutilated. She was found with her throat cut, but there was none of the ripping, in a sense. The, there was no removal of any of her internal organs. So Elizabeth Stride is murdered, but she is not desecrated as a person, as the other victims. What, what could possibly have been the reason for that? Well, the theory is that the killer was disturbed and he wasn't able to satisfy that bloodlust because he goes on, within an hour, 
to find a fourth victim where he does go berserk with a knife. We're coming up to Mitre Square, where this vile murder of Catherine Eddowes happens. What was so repulsive about this murder? Catherine Eddowes was found in the street. She'd been slashed across the face. The killer had really ripped her. He'd taken out her uterus. He'd removed one of her kidneys. So the scene that confronted the police was as gruesome as it gets in terms of the Ripper's attacks. So within an hour, two women are now lying dead on the streets of London, less than a mile apart. How big is this story now? The story that nobody thought could get bigger has suddenly got even bigger. But I think it would be more difficult for the crime reporters then to cover it in the way that I would cover it. In those days, there wasn't that kind of established relationship between the police and the press. So reporters either had to find their own contacts or bribe police officers. And reporters going around getting all these witness statements before the detectives caused confusion and further alienated the two groups, the police and the press. But so desperate were they for clues, the police allowed the publication of the Dear Boss letter. Soon, the whole country had heard the name Jack the Ripper. You can imagine the effect that that must have had on this growing mass of newspaper readers. Suddenly, this mysterious killer had a character. He was Jack the Ripper. I mean, manna from heaven for the headline writers. And, and the, the whole issue of these murders became the Jack the Ripper murders. I mean, how many rippers have we had since then? We've had the Yorkshire Ripper, the Suffolk Ripper, the Camden Ripper, because that is such a chilling soubriquet to attach to serial killers. The killer's new name helped newspaper sales to skyrocket. And the police began to wonder if the letter which christened him was actually the work of an unscrupulous journalist. What I feel quite sure about is that uh, whoever wrote the Dear Boss letter wasn't the person who killed those women. Um, because it's just too perfect, I think, really. It's exactly what a newspaper editor would want to work with. Police suspected a man from the Central News Agency but never had any proof. The author of the letter remained a mystery, but the real murderer lost no time, living up to his new Ripper nickname. On the 9th of November, inside this building, a cheap lodging house known as Miller's Court, the body of a young woman was discovered. There was such a slaughterhouse in Miller's Court. There is a horrendous mutilation uh, 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 over the body, completely uh, different scale to the other killings. The body was eviscerated, the face slashed beyond recognition, the breasts were cut off, the internal organs removed. It was just totally horrific. The victim's name was Mary Kelly. She was a 25-year-old prostitute. After her murder, much of the press coverage was devoted to speculation about who the killer might be. Having exhausted the foreign possibilities, newspapers rushed to the scandalous conclusion that the Ripper was not only English, but posh. The first suggestion was a decadent aristocrat. It was likely to be some toff going east who was slumming or looking for a prostitute. There was a lot of interest in aristocrats with fruity private lives. The idea that the murderer was a high society gentleman in his silk top hat immediately made it more newsworthy because these men, they were celebrities of their day and the idea that they had been involved in such a brutal, gruesome, squalid murder was a brilliant story. The gentleman angle was particularly popular with papers like The Star, whose readers came from the lower classes. It tunes in with